Hello, friends, and welcome back. Uh, we are here this time to discuss Frailty, the 19... Jeez, I just had the date up. Uh, 19, or sorry, 2001 movie. I was surprised that it was directed by Bill, by Bill Paxton, but I'm sure we'll get into that. But then before that, Anthony, will you give us an introduction? Hello, yes. Um, I'm Anthony Self. Um, I have written a couple of books. Uh, one of them is called Birthday Treat, a dystopian um, fiction about a futuristic totalitarian um, UK that is sort of part purge, part uh, running man, uh, part uh, 1984, and then also a horror anthology called Catbox. And I also do some indie gaming playthroughs on my YouTube channel, Horrible. Which just hit, I think, about a month ago, a thousand yeah. subscribers. Yeah, yeah got, the, got that milestone. Got that uh, under the belt now with a thousand subscribers. So uh, thank you all to everyone who's been watching, and um, I hope to entertain you with uh, more indie horror games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's a big accomplishment uh, to get a thousand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The and also uh, birthday treat is also part hilarious. It's also very <laughs> funny. So. There's a, there's a lot of like I I, can't, I kind of call it the kind of British humor. It's dark, a little bit macabre, but um, also kind of uh, tongue in cheek a little bit. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty Hopefully. pretty good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's very fun. It's my kind of humor, so definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tickle but, that dark, um, funny bone. Yes, it does. Yes, indeed. Mm. So Frailty, I was. Uh, it's one of the movies that I, I think the end can. On a rewatch, I, I caught some things that I didn't catch the first time. There were some, some tells that I didn't catch, yeah. the first time. But it, it is one that has one of those endings that are memorable. Mm, definitely, I think it's one of those type of films because I I'd seen it years ago, and um, for this discussion, I, I kind of rewatched it last night, and it kind of. It was really one of those weird things. It was like when I originally watched it, um, I remember being like thinking it was. I mean, it's it's a it's a great film. Like, I'm just going to get that out of the gate. It's it's a really good film. Um, maybe it's kind of it, ha- it does have that kind of late '90s, early 2000s aesthetic feel to it. Uh, if you know what I mean, like that kind of thrill. Yeah. There was a kind of whole run of like thriller films that have the same. I don't know what it is. Uh, the, the same sort of sensibilities in mm. in terms of like you know the kind of the cinematography the, the the pacing stuff like that but um i'd forgotten quite a lot about it i remember i remember the general consensus of what the film was about uh you know bill paxton's father figure seeing being told by god essentially that you know uh to kill demons in human form and he embroils his two young children into this um there's a lot of themes at play, uh, nature versus nurture, you know, what makes um, someone uh, feel that they've been spoken to by God, um, you know, the dynamic of the family, um, Every there's a lot of stuff. But yeah, that the third act, I remember it came back to me when I was watching it, and I think it's quite a divisive sort of ending because I think it's, hmm. it's either, it's almost like the first... Uh, the first part of it is kind of like unknown, uh, sorry, uh, usual suspects in that um, Matthew McConaughey, who plays an older version of the child of Bill Paxton, um, is retelling this to an FBI agent played by Powers Booth. And yeah, he basically, it's it's basically a flashback film. So there's mm-hmm. one, the, the first segment is when he, you know, just basically walks into the FBI building um, turns around to Powers Booth and says, uh, what's the killer's name again? It's uh, like the, the Hand of God or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, the hand, he, he basically proclaims that he knows who the Hand of God killer is. Powers Booth is a bit skeptical at first, uh, much like in The Usual Suspects. And then as the story goes on, we have flashbacks back to, uh, is it the sort of late 70s, I think? Um, yeah. I think around so. that era, yeah. And it's then Matthew McConaughey and his brother, and it's mainly from his uh, POV, um, of how his father basically wakes them up one night and say, tells them that you know God has chosen him to be the instrument of I don't know what you'd call it like his, his the end of the world the, the end of the world yeah, yeah he has to kill like was it uh, does he I, I can't remember if he says there's a certain amount of people that he needs to 
or demons. It's not people. It's demons that he's killing, and so therefore it's not actually murder. It's 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 doing the um, uh, acting as God's tool, as, as God's right hand in that respect. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, the, I think that the the, la- the 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 third act is it has to go a certain way, doesn't it? But we'll get to that. We'll get to that. That's just uh, yeah. <laughs> But it just well, the whole point is it reminded me how um, I how much I didn't remember, uh, yeah. but I hadn't seen it for years. So yeah, it was um, there was a lot that I uh, came back to me then as I was watching it. How did you think about the actual film in its kind of entirety? I think I saw this in the theater when it came out. I remember seeing it in the theater, and I'd forgotten a lot. I didn't, the the basic. The basics I remembered, but there was a few, you know, details that I forgot. And I was surprised Bill Paxton directed it. It did have that feel, though, like late 90s, early 2000s feel. It did have kind of that, kind of like that, just the feel, this, the cinematography and the music yeah. and the way that the camera moved and the shots and the, uh, the dialogue. It all felt a little, I don't want to say dated in a bad way, but... It's of it's it's of the time, yeah. And looking back now, it's easy to kind of criticize it or you know, pick at it. But other, you know, it, I think it's fine. But it it does feel a little bit. I don't see amateurish. It does because I think it's for Bill Paxton's first directing yeah gig, his directorial debut. Yeah, and Bill Paxton, he's one of those actors that everyone loves. Bill Paxton. I don't think he's all that good. <laughs> I don't think he's all that great. Steve. He's okay. I mean, he's blasphemy. He's Hicks, or he's Hicks. he's uh, <laughs> not Hicks. He's um, uh, Hudson. Hudson. In Aliens, yeah. Yeah. So that's um, kind of him. And he's in Tombstone. And there's a, a few. He has very, very memorable roles. But yeah. when it gets when you get down to the nitty gritty, I don't know that he's he's fine. He's not bad, but. I, yeah. yeah, I know what you mean. Like Bill Paxton, um, God rest his soul. Uh, Bill Paxton is Bill Paxton. I think when he's yeah. acting, like if that's what you mean in terms yeah. of the the term of like range. Uh, I, I I doubt he you know um, would ever win like an Oscar in that respect. But he is Bill motherfucking Paxton. <laughs> like I would I would I would have killed to have been uh, you know uh, to work to have any kind of um, working alongside or, you know, being an actor at that time sort of thing to, to have that opportunity. Uh, He just seems like a lot of fun. He just, yeah, I know know what you're saying. It is, you know, uh, rewatched the original Twisters again from the, the new film, the, or sorry, Twister um, following the, the new recently released Twisters. And it's just like, yeah, you could just tell like any kind of film shoot that he's on. If, if, if I was an actor and he was my co-star, I'd just be like, I know I'm going to have a good time. You know, yeah. we're going to have a, we're going to have a rip roaring good time on this one. <laughs> and um, yeah, this is a more, I say uh, leveled um, approach. Uh, I mean, you know, it's always, you always find films when you have directors who are directing themselves when they are an actor mm-hmm. on screen and whatnot. Um, that can sometimes shine through. But on this one, I mean, yeah, he. I think this is one of uh, Bill Paxton's most grounded performances. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's he. He's, it's a hard task because he's he's basically playing a person who is saying that he's been visited by God. Um, he's. You know, a single father. He's trying to bring up his two sons, and he's a mechanic. She's so got that kind of blue-collared sort of like working-class vibe mm. going on. And you know, imagine one day your father just coming and busting into your room and saying, "Like, children, um, I've been told by God that I have to get three items that will." You know, it's it's mad, it's crazy. But he plays it with such a nuanced way. He he plays it very. Um, empathetically you know it would be easy to kind of like just label this guy a a psycho killer um and you know uh, maybe like an abusive father in that respect but he's not he's not an abusive father at all like um we have the the older son whose name fenton is it yeah so you have Mm -hmm. fenton and adam and you have the the older brother fenton who is of that age where 
And this is another thing that I really loved about the film as well, because you have the two brothers. I, I don't think it actually tells you how old they are, but we're meant to, I think it's implied that the oldest one is maybe like 11 or 12, mm-hmm. and the younger one is maybe seven or eight. And you have that thing where the younger, the younger brother, Adam, like obviously is still in that stage of adoring his father. Like his father is God to him. Um, and I really like the kind of, the, the, the way they, play this out because Fenton is at that age where he's actually questioning his father now as you know I think you know we go all of us I think go to that through that stage where you become a teenager and therefore your parents are no longer your gods you know your parents are and you know you have some teenagers that get surly and have their emo phase and rebel and then you have other kids that are just like you know um so you, you there's a great dynamic at play here where you have Fenton as the older son who is starting to question things um, about his father. But then you have this authoritative figure. You have your father who's telling you what to do. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on. Then you have the younger brother, Adam, who's just blindly um, <laughs> following his father, what his father says, and being caught up in all this. And then you kind of have to think to yourself, like, um, you know, does this younger brother actually believe what his father's telling him? Or is he just going along for the ride? Because that's what you do when your parents tell you to do something, you do it. You know, so I found that really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I did, I did like when Adam wrote down the a list that he had been given, and I had a, a schoolyard bully and some other people he didn't like. Yeah, and uh, once I, again, like, yeah, yeah sorry, can't Steve. Yeah. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say that's another brilliant uh, example there because Bill Paxton's uh, character is obviously like, no, son. Um, you know, did God tell you this, or or are you just upset with this guy, sort of thing? And the young brother's like. And that's the, I suppose that's the kind of the horror in this film. It's not, it's not a, it's not a gory film. It's not a, you know, all the kind of scenes that you see where uh, Bill Paxton has his axe and everything. You don't see people being chopped up. Uh, it all happens. All the murders kind of, I think majority of the murders happen off screen. Um, it's the implied, like, wow. You know, when you, when you walking down the street sort of thing and you see, someone twerking and uh, tweaking in front of you sort of thing and you're like um this guy's clearly not well in the head um what would they do it's that kind of horror i think on this i think this would be more of a kind of thriller i I would label this film more as a thriller than a horror or anything like that but it is that implied thing of you know the religion aspect as well um it would be interesting to kind of i'm not particularly religious myself um but it would be it would be um sort of interesting to kind of see someone who is maybe very uh, devout in their in their faith um to kind of see how they perceive this film and how it's uh treating uh, those type of things because like obviously he's he's hearing god and we see a scene where he's you know um he's uh, working under a car and he actually sees this <laughs> yeah. i smite you godlike figure coming down with a fiery sword um <laughs> Yeah, but another thing that I found interesting as well, like you mentioned before, Steve, that um, there are things that you were picking up in the sort mm-hmm. of this rewatch, and I there was one thing in particular that I actually thought, oh, that's interesting because they don't actually say anything about it. It's a it's a, it's a photograph. It's when um, the, towards the start of the film, uh, in <clears throat> when Bill Paxton's uh, figure is, I think he's in bed, and it, the, the shot just kind of pans across, and you see like a photo of like a helicopter and maybe some soldiers, mm. and you do think, okay, so the timing could be he could be uh, Vietnam. This could be a, a form of PTSD, perhaps. Maybe this mm. is a form of trauma that he's experienced. But it's never nothing's actually ever said. I don't yeah. think uh, that he was in a war or anything like that. It's just a, a lingering little little shot that I just thought, you know what, that throws a bit more perspective now into terms of is this real or is this sort of Jacob's ladder sort of style thing going on? So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think it does a few things. It, when, when Adam does bring in the list and his dad, tell, did God really give this to you? And you, you, you start to wonder if Adam's going along because he believes or because he's trying to please his father, the items that the three items that he gets the dad is sympathetic, but when you get the, when he rolls, he brings in the pipe and he unravels the, it just looks, that's the weapon. That's so as a viewer, yeah. we're, we're thinking that this can't be, I mean, could you think you're going to receive three weapons or three items? You're thinking like a sword or something like, you know, mm. yeah, something that looks, has some, 
has some kind of biblical appeal. sort yeah. of yeah imagery attached to it but um <laughs> once again it's 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 one of those type of films as well that is it does have that unreliable narration going throughout um there's certain segments for example when um <clears throat> pardon me when uh, he is he sees his first item it's like this this sunlight beaming down on this barn um and then he goes to visit he goes to the barn and then he sees the axe the otis axe um and then the gloves i can't remember whether the gloves where did he see the gloves or they were next to the, i think they were next to the axe oh were they okay yeah, yeah. and um then finally yeah the 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 kind of pipe um they are you know strange items um but hey, you know, um, if you're if you're going to be doing demon slaying, what, what better than an axe? You know. Yeah, I, I think it's to place doubt in in our heads as a viewer, just to say this this guy's losing his mind. Like he, there's no way this is real. Mm. But while you were watching, did you ever do you remember the first time you watched it? If you ever thought maybe this is real, or did you always did you go back and forth, <clears> or did you? Did you think that it was uh, just him going insane? There were on my f- from. I'm trying to remember when I felt because I I can't remember when I when I first watched it or where I. It could have been the theater as well, or it could have been just like um, you know, uh, a DVD type thing. But um, I think there's a point in the film. So uh, another thing. So Bill Paxton, uh, the first victim or the first demon depending on, on where you're sitting on the fence, yeah. or whether you believe him or not, um, is, a, is, a, is a woman, right? She's a nurse. And um, he brings her into uh, the shed and basically says that, you know, she's been, what is it, killing people and, like, taking their, looting their, their um, cash and whatnot. And he, when he touches them, when he puts his hand on them, he can see their sins. Um and I liked the fact that you don't see you don't see any kind of like flashes of what they've done. It's all in Paxton's reaction. Mm. So at that point, you kind of think to yourself, is he actually seeing these things? Or is it just is he is it this elaborate performance in front of his two sons? Uh, these young impressionable minds that he's trying to, you know, manipulate. So there's that element to it, which I really liked um but the point i think for me was when i was like okay maybe maybe there is something more to this is when i think it's the is it the second demon or victim or the third when the younger brother um it could be the first i can't remember now off the top of my head but um when he puts down the axe when he um you know obviously kills the person fenton the older brother turns away and the younger brother and him are going, you, you see, you see? And there seems to be this like off-camera thing. And that's what I really liked about this, because you don't know. It's always left ambiguous to let you the, the viewer decide. Because you see the younger brother like is looking like boggly-eyed and is, oh my God, yeah, I see it, Dad, I see it. And once again, it kind of caters into this fact of like, is once again, as you're saying, like, is he just trying to like appease his, and make his father proud of him? So he's lying? Or does he actually see? This demon escaping like from the body, like there was a lot of that throughout, which I really liked. But then they obviously have to kind of draw a line, mm. and they have to go like, "Well, the end is the third act." Yeah, obviously goes a bit into that kind of territory. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that now, or you want to talk sure. about more about themes and stuff like. That. So yeah, so effectively, um, the whole monologuing uh, diatribe that Matthew. Um, McConaughey's character, the older brother now, when he's talking to Powers Booth, the FBI agent, Wesley Doyle, um, there's a point where he, it becomes apparent that he is not Fenton. Mm -hmm. He is actually the younger brother. And it's like a kind of like, that's the twist really, isn't it? That's the whole gotcha kind of moment. Because throughout the whole film, he's been saying that, you know, the film starts off with the Adam brother killing himself committing suicide and you know that in itself then as well is unreliable narration because he well did he we don't know like yeah. did he kill him la, la, la. Um, that's a little maybe that's a bit of a plot hole i'm not too sure 
But um, yeah, it turns out that Matthew McConaughey is actually the younger brother uh, all along. And he's been duping uh, uh, Agent Doyle um, because Agent Doyle, he believes him to be a demon as well. Um, and then it, the kind of cat is out of the bag when he touch, when Matthew McConaughey's uh, Adam character touches him and he finds out that he was the killer of his mother. And it's like, well, okay, there's suspension of disbelief, and then there's maybe this is screwing the pooch a little bit. Um, and Doyle goes, "How did you know?" And he was like, "Well, I can, I, I believe, and I can sort of see, and all this kind of stuff." And then there's also an, an element where um, the VH, like the the tape of his tape, is like blurred out and everything yeah. like that because God is protecting him. So you kind of think then, okay, so he he can actually see demons. He can actually, he is being protected by God. So this is all true then. This is all, the demons are, they're real and everything like that. And I think it loses a little bit of credibility because it's explaining hmm. that. I, I think it would have worked better if it was left completely ambiguous. Hmm. But then once again, it's like, what, what do you believe? Do you believe this is actually happening? Do you believe the tape was just caught uh, uh had some film grain in it or something you know it's yeah it's a, the point for me was when doyle goes how did you know and it's like well because he touched you and he obviously could tell your sins and then it turns out it transpires that matthew mcconaughey is actually a sheriff in this town um there's another sheriff that comes to visit him he touches him and he goes like you're a good man and it's like because he can obviously tell people's aura uh, or their pheromones i don't know but yeah how it works but um <laughs> Yeah, it, it was it was good, and now obviously it felt like a very kind of usual suspects kind of they mm. needed a kind of twist and everything like that. Apparently, I did read, pardon me, that the script was uh, originally going to be a lot darker. Um, mm. It wasn't going to go down that particular line, um, mm. but then I think Columbine happened, and that there had to be some changes because obviously reflecting in works of you know. Um, mass killings and whatnot so i think oh, we wow. had to yeah um but yeah it's i i think it's you know upon rewatching it um and because of a lot of stuff that i forgot previously um yeah i i enjoyed it i enjoyed it um it hasn't as you said like the aesthetics are very late 90s early 2000s um and in this day and age kind of thing, uh, you can definitely tell it's almost of that kind of like, you know, Rainmaker sort of style, like <laughs> almost police procedural, but like made for. And obviously I can imagine this wasn't like a massive budget as well. Matthew McConaughey at that time wasn't in his A-list superstardom status mm -hmm. at the time and everything like that. So, yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I think Doyle, did Doyle show up on the list? Is that why he visited him? Because he showed up on the list? I think his brother was on the list too, right? That's why he finally, because yeah, when, he, when the dad died, the dad whispered to him that he, your brother's a demon. But he had he was waiting until he showed up on the list. So yeah, do was, we do we actually find out what he whispers to Adam, young Adam, or is it kind of left I to? I don't know if this is ever explicitly said, but I think the dad at at some point the dad told him your brother's a demon, mm. and because we get hints that the older brother that God told the dad something about the older brother that the dad did refuse to believe. Like we're going to prove him wrong. You're yeah. going to dig this massive hole <laughs> and, and we're going to prove to God that you're not, you're not what he thinks you are. And uh, yeah. so we, kind of later we find out that God told him he's a demon, basically dooming him. Like you're going to have to kill him eventually. Yeah. So I, I, I think that's why I, I but I'm not sure why the brother waited so long to kill, why why he waited so long to kill the brother. I think it just worked out that way. I don't, or he waited till he was on the list. Yeah, it's kind of, I think like once again, it kind of goes into that, like if, if we, if we assume that, you know, Fenton's uh, name was on the list originally when Bill, uh, when Bill Paxton had the list, it kind of does make sense, like, Later, like throughout the movie, we see you know when uh, the young Fenton is back chatting to his dad and basically saying like you know what you're doing is wrong, 
And the dad is like, imagine, I mean, imagine that. Imagine being a yeah. father and like having your son's name on this list that there he's a demon and he's sort of trying to, you know, coax him through. He basically, there's a point where he, what, um, imprisons him in the mm-hmm. shed for like a week. Um, and it's like, you know, have you learned, have you learned your ways now, essentially? Like, um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of brutal on his character as well. Like, um, what he's going through in terms of imagine that imagine actually getting the voice of god in your head telling you to you know do these demons and once again another interesting part is when the young fenton escapes from the shed he, he runs away and he kind of goes to the local local sheriff of the the town they're in and says like you know my dad's killed these people you got to come and and the sheriff comes back he brings young fenton back and at first he's like, ah, your son's telling tall tales and, you know, Paxton's character is like going, ah, I know, I know. But then there comes that kind of moment where it's like, can I just check the shed? There's nothing in the shed. But then Paxton has to kill him because, mm-hmm. you know, and that's the first time when he's like literally breaking down because he's like, I've actually, he doesn't feel like he's killed a demon. He's actually killed a real person mm-hmm. and he's upset and he's like going, Oh, see, now this is what you've made me do. I, I, you know, there's remorse there, yeah. um, which is funny because obviously with the other victims slash demons, um, there is no remorse because he feels like he's doing God's work. He feels justified that he's doing this. Um, so I thought that was really interesting that there is this kind of weird, not justification, if you will, but this sort of code of conduct of, you know, um, killing the demons as opposed to killing real people. Um, destroying yeah. demons. Destroying demons. Destroy yeah. them. Smite them. Yeah. Yeah, The I think another thing that this film explores is faith and what blind faith, or I don't know if you can say blind, because he believes he sees the angels and... yeah that God talks to him, but how far people will, are willing to go in the name of faith. Like you're willing to force your, to go out and kill people and then force your kids to be accomplices and then force your kid yeah. to dig a hole that you put said demons into. And you, you trap them for a week with a glass of water a day. Yeah. So nearly killing him. Mm. So, it, you know, the, the, the boundaries that you will, or the, the lines you're willing to cross in the name of faith is you know it is it's yeah it's pretty i mean i once again as i said i I think this would be if i was a particularly religious person if i you know went to church every week and you know said my prayers and (laughs) i think i i might be looking at this differently um i think one can be spiritual it doesn't have to be does you don't have to be religious you can be spiritual um but yeah, I, it's a strange one because I kind of I think to myself, have have I ever fervently believed in something so much that it would that I would kill? Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a strange concept. Um, hmm. <laughs> yeah, it it kind of it bakes the noodle a little bit, you know. Yeah, um, it does. Hmm, and. I, I kind of laughed. I kind of laughed at the, the the effects, the special effects, the the whole sequence of the angel comes down, and yeah. it looks really it looks really goofy. And then I wondered, is that just because of the budget or of the time, or did they deliberately make it look a little bit silly to place doubt in our minds? Like this can't be real. Like this this guy's insane. Yeah. I think it's. I mean, it's <laughs> it is very. You just see <laughs> descending down with his flaming sword. Um, I personally, I think it was meant to be so over the top's not the right word, but so uh, mismatched with everything that we've seen thus far mm-hmm. that it sort of pulls you out. And I think that's meant to be the whole point because, like, at the time he's underneath a car and there's a lot of sparks, you know, uh, welding sparks and everything flying, and it gives that sense of, you know, uh, flames and whatnot. And then he, then he sees this thing. Um, so yeah, it is. It's very. It's, it's kind of out there, but I think it has to be because in order, like, if if you just saw a random guy, like, say, walk in and go hi, and he had like a halo behind him or something like that, it just it wouldn't be as effective. I don't think. I, I mean, I enjoyed it. I, I like the the whole um, 
segment with the with the the angel or the god himself or whatever it might be sort of descending down upon bill paxton as he's working on a you know transmission or exhaust pipe of a, of a pickup truck or something like that um <laughs> yeah it's uh yeah I don't know if, if something like that to happen to me. I, I think the first thing I'd be doing is going to the doctors, obviously, you know, yeah. um, saying like, "Oh, I'm I'm seeing things, I'm seeing these things." But once again, it goes back to the faith, doesn't it? It goes back to what you believe in. Um, hmm. Another thing that I think I, I didn't notice the first time, but there is a picture of their mom on the kids' beds. Between the beds, there's a picture of their mom that had died. So you also, it also makes you wonder: Is the dad suffering? Is he overwhelmed with grief and loss? Because he seems fine on the surface. So what would what would drive him to do something like this? Is it because of the the grief he feels to loot from losing his partner and kind of just we're gonna go see your mom and let's kill some demons on the way down? I mean, it's interesting because I. I could be wrong. I, I, I might have. It might have been like a throwaway comment that I just missed. I'm not sure. But do we actually uh, from from the beginning of the film? You don't. We don't actually know. We know she's not there. She's not in the picture. And um, I believe there is a, a line of something of like she died. But I, I, in my head, I don't know why I was thinking that it was due to like an illness. I could be completely wrong. But um, I don't remember there being anything about saying that she was stabbed or she was murdered or anything like that until like the end part. And it's like, that just comes out of nowhere. Hmm. I thought a little bit. So it would have been interesting if like, as you said, like, because if, if, you know, he's a single father, um, he's trying to raise two boys, um, working at a garage and all this kind of stuff. And if the, like, yeah, if, if we had have found out maybe at the beginning that the mother had been slain, by an unknown person, then I think that would have added to the mix of everything that's going on. Because then you'd be a bit more like, yeah, as you said, like, is he is he doing this because he's he's mentally breaking down, um, mm-hmm. and is he, or is it because of the fact that he's maybe trying to, I don't know, did he kill her, sort of thing? And like, this is like what he's always been like. Yeah. So there's a lot of added dynamics that are thrown in the mix but we don't notice from my perception anyway of it um there could have been a line or something as i said that i just didn't pick up on um but yeah we don't know until the end that doyle was actually the mother's killer um Mm -hmm. yeah well doyle doyle killed his mom right yeah 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 there's lots of lots of ambiguity in this one hmm Lots of things. I love a film of yeah. yeah. I love I love ambiguous films and I love films that make you question like you can I'm one of those kind of people if I'm watching a thriller or a mystery, I'm always trying to, you know, trying to guess, you know, what's happening, coming down the line, what's over the hill. And I like being thrown a curveball. I like being thrown a kind of something that logistically and logically makes sense and I go, Oh, all right, yeah, 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 I can understand that. I, that makes sense to me. But then other other times if you have like you know Deus Ex Machina's, or you have like third acts, U turn things that are completely out of you're like ah, it's a bit of a cop out or a bit of a cheap <laughs> kind of way going out sort of thing, and uh, yeah, I kind of, I mean to me, I, I remembered, and I don't know once again this is rewatching it. Um, I was watching it with my partner, and she hadn't seen it before, um, so I was. It wasn't until like halfway of the film, and then it clicked with me. Oh yeah, I remember now that Matthew McConaughey is actually the uh, the younger brother. He's not the older brother. And um, I think before the reveal happens, um, she did sort of ask me like, "Is is, uh, is there something? Is he? He's not. He's not going to be the." And I don't know if that's because of the fact that we've had so many films since then. You know, hmm. since the like the um, late two thousands that. You know, like the Sixth Sense and um, other kind of gotcha, sort of twisty ones. And there's always, I mean, films since the dawn of time have always had like twists and turns in them, and you know, uh, last act reveals. Um, but yeah, I think you can kind of telegraph this one coming. I, I do you remember mm-hmm. how? Did you kind of see it coming before you knew it was going to happen, or did, was this like a complete surprise to you when you first saw it? On the initial watch, I don't think I picked up on the clues. Mm. Um, I was more focused on the dad and his 
what I what I thought was his descent into madness. Yeah, but yeah, on the second match, it, it was when he he talks about I, I promised I would bury him here, and then we have the we have the flashback about the older brother uh, Fenton saying, you know, when I die, I promise you bury me here. In the rose so garden. Yeah, yeah, in the rose garden. So yeah, I think um, yeah, I didn't really catch it the first time, but like you said, I think we're more like we're the more movies you watch, the more likely you are to pick up on those sort of things. Yeah, it's an interesting one though. Um, but I mean, the thing is as well, like as soon as you get Powers Booth in any role, ninety five percent of the time he's going to be a villain. So yeah. it's it's one of those type of things where you know you see him even if he's playing an FBI. I don't know if he's like the director or he's like an FBI just agent uh, in this respect, but I think he's just an agent. But like <laughs> whenever you have Powers Booth, you just know he's going to be a villain. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there are just certain there are certain actors that just you know that deep gravelly voice, the way he holds himself. Um, once again, like yeah, with Tombstone, uh, you know, mm. um, same same thing really. It's it's that kind of thing of. Um, Certain certain actors are just uh, villains, you know. They just have that yeah. villainous look. So, yeah, yeah I think, um, yeah, he he definitely has a presence. I think his, his facial expressions. He has that that real that smile. That's just he, he just he's about to tie somebody to some railroad tracks. Yeah, you know, he's he has that look. Definitely. Yeah. So, but I still wondered at the end, even on a rewatch, is is this really happening, or is this is this just him being corrupted by his dad, and he's just continuing? And because we do, so we, I guess you could call the confirmation the video at the end. His the faces are blurred, and the dad tells them God will make us invisible; He'll protect us. So was it just chance? Or is this just a small town sheriff who has this conspiracy going? His wife or his girlfriend or whatever it is is the secretary for the police station who's covering for him. Is this just somebody going about and believing that he's destroying demons? And or I, don't, I guess the video, I guess, could be confirmation that it's real. And I guess that's the funner. I don't know. I guess it depends on your outlook. I mean, I want yeah. it to be kind of this kind of it's kind of it's a I don't know if you say it's a happier ending because <laughs> he's just he's getting rid of demons, but mm. the other side is he's killing innocent people. <laughs> so. Well, that's it. Yeah, I mean, it's it depends on how you look at it um, because obviously when Doyle goes back when they go back to the um, who he at the time believes is uh, Adam's residence. Where there are then there's that there, there's loads of graves. Mm. There are loads of shallow um, <laughs> graves in the rose garden. So and he's obviously been doing this since. I mean, if he was like ten when his father was bringing people back into the shed to kill them, and he's now <laughs> meant to be in his like mid thirties or whatever. So he's been doing this for a long time. And yeah, as he said, like it depends on which side of the fence you sit on. Um, if you believe him to be this devout, you know, person who's killing demons then, hey, more power to you sort of thing. If you, if you think he's just a serial killer, essentially, then, yeah, it's a bit more... I think it... I... I like the video thing. Like, it's blurred out, and it's like, it's conceivable that maybe there was some kind of malfunction with the, uh, with the uh, security camera, or, you know, if they made, if they made out a little bit more th along those lines, you know... And instead of Doyle saying, like, how did you know? Like, I think it would have mm. been better if the third act was he touches him and you have the same thing that Paxton's character had. Like, you know, he, had, he recoils or something like that. And then he says something along like, and I think it's, if it's always left to the viewer to kind of decide for themselves, this, I think, is trying to shoehorn the fact that they are actual demons and he is actually doing the the, the, the good work of the Lord sort of thing. And... You know, um, it works better as a happy Hollywood ending that way, mm. right? Um, yeah. But if they did, yeah, if they did make it more ambiguous, like, as you said, like, you know, there are a few little things that maybe didn't work out. If Doyle didn't have to say, like, how did you know? It could have, yeah. I think that would have made a, a, of a better ending. 
um, mm. because then it would have truly been like, you know, that shot where he uh, shakes the sheriff's hand at the end and goes, you're a good man, and then he walks away. You could have had that play out so many different ways. You could have had him just like lingering shot as he watches the sheriff walk off, and you still don't know, like, if he is a serial killer who's just been uh, nurtured because of his ill father, you know. That would have been more interesting, but I think they are trying to go with the whole, you know, yeah, he is a demon killer and he's doing the good work of the Lord. So he, we can give him a whole pass on this, you know, in that respect. Yeah. So at the very beginning, when he's when when he's sitting in the office waiting for Doyle, he is holding the picture of Doyle and his mom. Yes. Yeah. So he is. Um, he's kind of already. So he was. He's he, just. I think he's putting it together, right? Because on the on the yeah. car ride over, he does ask him about his mom and. Yeah. Did they ever find the killer? And Doyle does give a look like, oh, no, they never found him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 No, it's, it is, it's an interesting one. Um, yeah. Hmm. Only, only in a small town, though, could you pull this kind of shit off. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. yeah if, they, if they remade that now, it'd be like, oh, God, imagine with all the, you know, GPS on the phones and the and the and the, uh, but then saying that, then God makes them invisible, you know. So because yeah. there's that there's that, <laughs> there is that part, yeah, when they basically uh, Paxton tackles the the guy into the um, the van, and he's like, well, we're out in the middle of the, we're in you know during the day, and it's like, oh, God will make everyone blind. Like, <laughs> Don't worry about it. Yeah, I wish I had that kind of confidence in life. You know, I'd just be like, <laughs> go into a bank and rob a bank. Ah. God will make them all blind. They won't see him as I run off with this big, hefty bag of cash. Um, yeah. <laughs> Gotta protect me, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry about it. Demon slaying. Um, and that would be something to put in your resume as well, right? Demon That's, slaying. That's, yeah, I'm You see out. that uh, you haven't been, um, you know, well, it's just the three-year period that you haven't been working. Oh, demon slaying. It's fine. I was destroying demons, doing God's yeah. work, you know. Yeah. No big deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's all good. <laughs> You know, even so though what, this is... I'm um, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so what would you rate this film, like, if you had to give it an out of 10, Steve? Yeesh. I'm, I don't know. I'd... Pushing maybe an 8. Mm. Yeah, a 7 or 8, for sure. I think it's... Yeah. 7 or above. So I, I'll say 8, because I think it's a... It's an intelligent, fun, good ending, lots of ambiguity... It does. It is of its time. I mean, but I don't think you should hold that against yeah. it. Um, no, no, not at all. Yeah. So yeah, it's up there. What about you? I I would give it a solid seven. Um, I said like I I really enjoyed. Um, it's once again it's that weird thing though because I think I'm probably watching this through more uh, rose tinted glasses because of mm. the fact that Bill Paxton passed away, and I can I can watch that man in anything. You know, uh, even Agents of Shield, I can I can watch him in that. You know, wow. but um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, it's it's one of those things where I think he he gives a very grounded performance. Um, he's playing a father who we're probably not meant to feel sympathy for, or we're not mm. meant to. But he gives. I I don't know what it is. Like he's just got this really vulnerable real edge to it sort of thing um that i really really like and even the the young actors that are playing the young adam and fenton as well like uh they, they do a good job um you know you watch a lot of films back in that era in that sort of time where you know you either have like um cory feldman sort of that that you know young teenage star type thing mm -hmm. breaking out like um, but these 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 two boys are um, you know really selling it in terms of just the realness of it because as I said once again you have this almost maybe twelve year old boy who's questioned his father and that's always going on like I said like when he sort of punishes him by digging a massive dirt hole that will become the the kind of cellar for this shed and then locking him imprisoning him for like you know he doesn't want to do it but um, he's not an abusive father he loves his children. Um, yeah. But he's following God's instructions, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> hmm. 
even you know this is about 2001 i kept thinking while i was watching it you you won't see a movie like this in theaters you it's changed a lot i think maybe uh, streaming you'd see a movie like this you'd see it on a streaming service somewhere so then i wondered is that a good thing or a bad thing it's interesting um you know the kind of state of films that we're in at the moment um you know the whole at the moment at the current moment in time i don't know if you've seen you know, uh, francis Ford coppola's megalopolis um is basically come out and uh at the start of the the new trailer that's come out now is like having all these people basically say his past films were all bad like you know apocalypse oh. now was really bad and all this kind of stuff and it's that trying to subvert the uh, expectations by it, yeah it's it's I, i'm trying to think of something a, a film a re, like a recent film or a modern film that's done something similar like this um i think maybe we've become so desensitized by the amount of real life sort of you know documentaries that you get on netflix any kind of like crime thing that is actually about and, and this was apparently based on a, a real story um oh. yeah about a father let me just um try and find the do 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 yeah, loosely based on the case of American serial killer Joseph Callinger, who murdered three people and tortured the four families. He committed these crimes with his 13-year-old son, Michael, between 1974 and 1975 in New Jersey. Uh, Callinger pleaded insanity, claiming God had told him to kill. Um, hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I can't really think off the top of my head of any similar film. There probably is one. I'm just missing it. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, it would be good because I mean, like we're, we're so encumbered by safe films these days, you know, triple a films with money in the bank. Uh, if you had like a kind of down to grassroots, it doesn't have to be particularly, the budget doesn't have to be particularly massive. It doesn't have to, it just has like, you know, these themes that are, quite prevalent even in today's society you know religion is something that's never going to go out of fashion in that respect um yeah it would be interesting to kind of see as you said like i i think i think they could remake this um and yeah. I, I i abhor myself for saying that because you know remakes reboots are not something you should do but um if they did remake this i wonder what the slant would be um I would make it more ambiguous in that respect of you never know, even until like the final frame of the film, you never know whether, you know, um, the, the son is just taking on his father's brainwashing or taking on his power from God, you know, because that's another thing as well. If, if Bill Paxton is meant to be originally is meant to be the guy who hears the voice of God and is conducting all these things, how does that power transfer to the son? Hmm. You know? Well, I think when the dad first walks in the room, he tells him, we've been chosen. Uh, yeah. So maybe the, the whole family's been chosen, not just him. It's a bit coincidental, though, isn't it? Building a building an army. Mm. Hmm. The army of demon slayers. I, I do think this can be remade as, as much as I don't. I'm not particularly fond of remakes. This one, I think, could be remade and revamped a little bit. I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I think the, in th the theater experience is a lot different now and then studios aren't taking risks on movies like this. I think streaming services will probably, probably have movies that are, take different, you know, more chances and I think the bigger studios want the sure things and they want like blockbusters and so it's, it's a very different landscape now than it was then. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to think of like the last, because whenever I kind of think of like thriller, religious sort of thing, I always think of like exorcisms type films. You know, mm -hmm. the last one I watched was the one with Russell Crowe, where he played, not the, the Pope's exorcist, there's a more recent one, mm. um, where he plays like an actor who, they're basically, um, uh, they're redoing The Exorcist. Oh. Um, and so Russell Crowe uh, is this actor who basically starts getting possessed essentially 
it's oh. not great. It's not a great film. But like when you you know when you kind of like <laughs> throw religion in, it's usually of that type of ilk mm -hmm. in that kind of sense of good versus evil. Um, usually by demonic possession. Yeah. Um, and the person's faith will either out do the the demon or anything like that. But in this one, it is literally that kind of as you said, like the 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 kind of question of if you're if you believe in a, a deity or you know a kind of christ-like figure who's spoken to you and is saying that like, these people are demons like you know is that whole like yeah i mean you can imagine uh, i can't think of a, a recent story but seen as it was based on the real life thing where the guy pleaded insanity mm. and just said he's you know uh, uh, god told him to do it but isn't that just an easy way out now, i could go out tomorrow and just kill like fuck 10 people and just be like yeah they were demons they were goddamn <laughs> demons i was doing the lord's work <laughs> hallelujah <laughs> You know, yeah. um, I'd still be thrown in the in the in the jail, but yeah. would I get like a minimum security type thing for it? Mm. If I plead insanity, but that's you know a lot of people now try that, don't they? They try and go for the insanity plea, and it's yeah. become so numerous that everyone's like, no, you can't do it. And I'm sure there are laws now that prevent people from doing that just for that reason to try and get off a. I've, I've, I'm sorry, I've, I've kind of digressed into like no, weird. <laughs> no, I was, I, was thinking, I was thinking about, uh, yeah, I think that was very popular there for a while. The whole, the devil, the devil made me do it or God made me do it. Um, and I think now people are just like, yeah, I'm crazy. You know, I did it. I'm crazy. So yeah, it is. I'm not sure that there's many things you can do. I mean, how can you prove that you're crazy? I guess you'd have to be evaluated by someone to determine if you really are crazy or just crazy, so yeah, it's like a kind of catch twenty two scenario, isn't it? Yeah. You can't be uh, if you if you label yourself crazy, then you're not crazy, you know. So and plus, if you if you claim in guilty by insanity, you have to be guilty. I'm guilty instead of trying to. So no, I didn't do anything. Then you can try and get out, but I guess yeah. I didn't really I didn't realize it was based on a or loosely based on a true story. Yeah, I think it's kind of loosely based, isn't it, in terms of... I think the the most effective thing here is that it's the children, bringing in the children mm -hmm. um, into his... Whether you believe him to be an actual touched-by-God person who is doing the Lord's work, or you see him as a, a mentally unwell person who is doing this. But there's no, like... Imagine, like, the MO, right? You, you have serial killers that their MO will usually be of the same... You know, like look at Dharma sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Look at you know these. A lot of the killers of the past will tend to kind of, <laughs> in, in a very kind of roundabout way, stick to what they know. Yeah. Um. You know, he he's bringing in the first one's a nurse. Mm -hmm. Like you think, why you why a nurse? Like the someone who's helping people, but then the second person isn't it the um uh is it the guy. Oh, I can't remember now off the top of my head. But they're all different people from different backgrounds. And mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to be... It's random. It just seems completely random. And he's been given this list of names. Like, you do have to wonder to yourself, like, does he know these people? Or is where did he get these names? Like, you don't just go through the yellow pages and just kind of... Or maybe he did. And that's maybe the whole thing. But, yeah. but it, it seems like if he was that unstable... And this is in the film, obviously. I'm, I'm talking from that, but he's he's a loving father. Like he's not. He doesn't show any apart from you know imprisoning his child in the barn. But that's because of the fact that he. <laughs> I think, as you were saying, like he, his name maybe will be on the list, and he wants to kind of rid himself of what he may have to do. Mm -hmm. um, so there is that element to it as well that if he was like an abusive father, then the audience would be like, well, he's clearly not well in the head you know no. he, but because he's not like there, there's moments in the film where he's um talking to the the eldest brother uh, fenton and it's like very softly like you know he can understand that what he's asking of them to do is you know ridiculous but at the same time it must be done you know i think there's like certain parts where he, he kind of turns around and goes it, it is the will we have to do this like and of that era as well, I think of like if it's meant to be in the late late seventies and whatnot, um, 
a different kind of generation as well. Like, you know, of the, when you set your mind to something, you set your mind to something and you do it. <laughs> Not like these snowflakes these days, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Right. It, it, that, that's, <laughs> that's another element as well. Like, you know, um, yeah. So it is, there are a lot of interesting concepts at play here. And, um, yeah, I yeah. think that you can, you're either going to believe that he um, is seeing these things or you're not. And I, now with the ending, to me, it's like, oh, okay, well, they've, they obviously, they obviously do see demons and, yeah. you know, this kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's a feel good ending, I guess, because you know that he's actually killing people that, are demons and not just innocent random people. So, yeah, it's much. Uh, but yeah, if they made it more ambiguous, it could be very, it would be very dark. But that might be mm. fun to play with, maybe someday. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of wiggle room that you can make here for, you know, and they they do. This is the I I feel like that there was some kind of like I don't know studio interference or like towards the end they may not have known where they were going to go with it, mm. so they had to go with this kind of ending of you know oh Doyle actually killed my mother and uh, but if is that if that was the case as well then why didn't they try and kill Doyle a long time ago like why is it being left now until uh, he's grown up now he's like what well, yeah that. Just little things that don't really add up for me in that respect. Because um, you said, like, the Bill, list. <laughs> there's a lot of people on the list. They've got a lot of killing to do. You know, it's just it's destroying. Just, uh, destroying. Destroying, sorry. Yes, destroying. Yeah. Um, it's not something you do like uh, you wake up on Monday and you're like, right, got the. Uh, gonna wake up Monday and uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Gonna get all these people done. Hmm. Maybe you can. Maybe, yeah. You have God on your side. You can do anything. You really can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. sure there's a motivational poster that we can use with the, with, you know. Oh yeah, we can body, get a body Christ. You know, yeah. get. You can do it. God will protect you. Can. you. Yeah. Uh, Destroy demons. Yeah, this is a. It's, it was a good rewatch. It, it was better than I remembered. I remember it being pretty good, but it was better than I remembered. What made you um, pick this as a as a film to? Uh, I think I forget. I think it might have been Susanna who mentioned it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Mm. No, it's yeah, it's definitely. It, I said like it, it, I'd forgotten more about this film um, than I remembered, sort of thing. Yeah. So it was it was actually really interesting to kind of rewatch it, especially with someone who hadn't seen it before, um, mm -hmm. and then was kind of like you know, sort of going, oh yeah, ooh, this is this is interesting as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> It yeah, it was, a, it was a good one. I think. Uh, yeah, glad we we glad it, it was. I was happy to rewatch it. It was a good one. Mm. Yeah, um, just seeing if there's there's an interesting story about the axe. Oh, the Otis axe, um, which is um, essentially when asked why the axe um, used as the name Otis carved on the handle. Paxton stated that he wanted the axe to have its own personality and to be unique. Um, he found the name in uh, Pasadena when he was there scouting for locations to film. And he met a homeless man and offered to give him some money. Um, the homeless man didn't want charity, so Paxton said offered to buy the use of the man's name for the movie. And the man's name was obviously Otis. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so bit of IMDb trivia there for you. Hopefully he compensated the poor guy for using his name. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's why, because the homeless man didn't want charity, so he basically said, like, well, instead of charity, I'm paying you to use your name in the film. So, I mean, hmm. he could have given him just 10 bucks. We don't know, yeah. but that's, <laughs> yeah. it, doesn't, it, doesn't say, it doesn't say how, how much, much he paid yeah. him. But um, I imagine um, it would have been more than uh, 10 bucks. Hopefully, for Otis's yeah. sake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, this is, I mean, for me, this, this, um, this kind of brings about, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it has that kind of nineties mentality. Um, mm. but also at the same time, it's, it's got depths that you don't 
get in a lot of those type of films as well. I think it's only marred by the kind of third act, you know, gotcha reveal twist. Um, I think I think it could have gone a different way, i.e., not having to. I mean, obviously, I love I love those type of films where the start of it has someone confessing to a crime, or you know, or going into the police station and talking about what's happening. Um, mm. And this is following that kind of thread. And I always love those kind of like flashbacky films where you'll kind of intercut sometimes back to the main narrative or, the, you know, the, the, the now narrative. In this case, Matthew McConaughey and Powers Booth uh, in The Office. Um, but yeah, I really like those. Um, this is like a kind of genre of things that, as you said, like you don't really get anymore. Mm-hmm. So it's really refreshing to kind of like see that um, happen. I'm just once again trying to think of another recent film that had that kind of whole aesthetic where it's flashing back to certain segments of, you know, a, a, a different time or something like that. Um, hmm. I can't think of anything. No, not off the top of my head. But um, hmm. yeah, and then, but I think, as I said, like I think that the third heart, the the third act is really up to people decide whether they are really invested in this one then or not. Um, hmm. but yeah I'd give this a solid 7 definitely um, do we know like if Paxton directed like this is his directorial debut I'm sure mm-hmm. he did direct other things but um, let's just see oh, five things okay uh, uh-huh. okay the greatest game ever played and tattoo oh that was a short the greatest oh, wow. game ever played. What was that? 2005. Oh, Shirley Um In the 1913 US Open, 20-year-old Francis Ulmit uh, played golf against his idol. Hmm. Hmm. Not much of a golfer myself, so... Can't say I've ever seen that one. Oh, he did, he did direct an episode of Saturday Night Live, too. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I would say, like, you know, this is this was... Yeah, as, uh, you can tell the budget's not in the heavens for this. Um, it no. doesn't need to be. It's no. a very, it's a character, it's a character piece, right? It's a character-driven mm-hmm. piece. So, um, yeah, I think um, everyone involved put in the effort. You know. Yeah, it's a good one. Hmm. Anything else you can think of from this one? Hmm. No, I, I I do think this. If you haven't seen this, and we spoiled it for you now, so yeah, apologies. Yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe put up a spoiler warning at the very beginning of this, Steve. Um, yeah. you know before we uh, do that. But um, if you haven't seen, I, I do recommend it. Um, and it, it, it's one of those type of films where I think anyone you speak to that's watched it will have, as you said, like the, like you said at the very beginning, like you know picking up little things. But I picked up, like, um, I could be completely wrong when I picked up that whole, like, you know, maybe he was in Vietnam and la 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 sort yeah. of thing, like, war thing. Because, it once again, it, there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes, if that makes sense, even in front of the camera. There's a lot of stuff that the subtext is is really good here. Um, and there might be, obviously, some stuff that's flown over my head. But then if you talk to someone else about it, they'll be like, here's my mm. impression and here's my opinion. And you're like, oh, actually, I didn't think about that. It's one of those type of films. It really is one of those type of films that once you've finished watching it, you'll be talking about it with the, if you're watching it with a group of friends, if you're watching it with a partner, if you're watching it with your dad. Maybe not watch this with your dad if, you, if you're two <laughs> brothers and you know yeah. he, starts, he starts saying that he's, he's heard God um, yeah. or something like that because then you might have to uh, vacate the premises. But... um. No, it definitely is one of those type of films that you will certainly be talking about it um, after the credits have rolled. And mm-hmm. in my opinion, that's always the the sign of a, a really good film, um, yeah. regardless of what the nature is, what the substance is, what the content is, um, if you're there at the end of it. What, one of the best things I love doing is when I go to cinema, either with friends or my partner or whatnot sort of thing, is coming out and then spending like, you know, maybe having a few drinks and just just, just chatting about it mm-hmm. and just dissecting it and just kind of, you know, absorbing it, let it marinate sort of thing. Yeah, I love that. There's so many films that you can come out of nowadays and just be like, yeah, that was a film. Yeah, uh, was, and instantly forget it, you know. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, but um, no, this one is definitely one of the 
the latter ones where mm. you'll come out and you'll be like, did was was he? Don't really don't know. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. What well about you yourself? Sorry. What about yourself? Like, what are you? No, I think um, we pretty much covered everything. I, but I do agree that I think it's it's one of those ones that you'll have some something to talk about after. For sure, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely a good one to discuss because there's lots of little things and the ambigu- the ambiguity, I think, is what sets this one apart. Definitely, yeah. um, almost. I put it up there with like the thing, you know, John Carpenter's the thing at, at the end of. Uh, where you don't know whether McCready or Charles is the thing. Maybe that's a bit too much. I'm going to retract that statement. No, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. No. You, you, the most ambiguous ending of a film is John, John Carpenter's the thing, and that always will be maintain the crown, is the champion, it's got the trophy. This is up there. Yeah. But not, not at that level. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I really wouldn't mind seeing a remake one day. Uh, that'll make it a little bit more ambiguous at the ending anyway, I think, but, or at least something in this kind of, in this wheelhouse, maybe not a direct remake, but something close. You still got to have the, uh, the angel or the God person coming down with the sword. I mean, you've got to keep that in. That's yeah. You, you can't redo that scene. That's just too good. <laughs> yeah. It's too good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was goofy. <laughs> yeah, it was a good one. I'm glad we, uh, we uh, came to discuss it. Mm, definitely so until next time where can people find you Um, you can find me on YouTube um, at Horrible uh, where I do mostly um, indie gaming playthroughs Uh, I've also got two books out which you can find on Amazon Uh, that's Birthday Treat and Catbox and Other Strange Tales very nice cool that was a good one thanks for uh, taking time yeah thanks for having me yeah. So until we'll have to decide what to do next, <laughs> but <laughs> but until next time, we'll talk to everyone soon. Bye.